Thank you, Kate. Cheered me up. It's having a bit of a bad day, so it's a nice introduction. We can't dim the lights, can we? I feel a bit uh, in the spotlight here. It's possible to drop them. Um, so, this image is what most people think landscape architects do. They make pretty pictures. They make landscapes, the sort of 17th century um, origin of the concept of landscape. The theory being that prior to painting and poetry that spoke about the land, there wasn't really a popular conception of landscape, that people just lived in the woods and in the fields and went about their daily lives. There wasn't a self-awareness or a self-consciousness of this phenomenon called landscape until it was bodied forth through poetry and painting. Um, and then, of course, uh, reflection upon the physical characteristics of land, uh, as informed through poetry and painting, became the big, the big drivers for the emergence of landscape architecture in the 17th and 18th century in Europe. Um, this pictorial tradition, there's nothing wrong with it. I actually like this, this painting. I actually like many uh, landscape paintings. And um, as an avid dog walker and uh, uh, inhabitant of many different landscapes, I, I'm a little bit of a romanticist myself. On the other hand, um, paintings do, and, and, and conceiving and treating landscape purely pictorially does have limitations. Uh, as a designer, if you only think in terms of pictures or scenes, uh, it tends to create a, a distance between the viewer and the object, as if you're standing outside the frame, as if you're stopping the car at a scenic overlook to take a picture. You're not really in it. You're not really walking in it. You're not really using it. You're not engaging it. And one of the things that uh, I was struck by... Um, when uh, in reading Walter Benjamin many years ago was this concept he had that urbanism and landscapes are more, uh, you know, they're not like paintings and sculpture. They're really a background. He says the aesthetic reception of which is perceived by a collectivity in a state of distraction. So this notion of strolling, walking, engaging, and being, you know, going about your own thoughts in your own world and having that ambient background, the aesthetic reception of which is not so immediate as it might be in a picture, but is somehow um, uh, deeper, accrued in a deeper way through use. So uh, with taking measures across the American landscape, this was in the mid-90s, um, I'd been in the US about 10 years and I didn't feel I knew a lot about America, but I knew that everything I'd learned in Europe about landscape architecture sort of didn't apply in the United States in some way because the United States to me seemed to be much more real, much bigger. And it, you know, you take a commercial uh, air flight across the US and you look at the grids and the circles and the development patterns, and you really see a landscape that, is, that isn't about uh, pictorialization, that isn't about beautification. It's actually about a brutish, pragmatic, uh, technical attitude towards how to work with the land. And that sort of interested me. It, seemed, it seems in many ways more valid, less effect than just viewing landscape aesthetically that if you could pay attention to the forms, the extraordinary forms and patterns and geometries and beauty that a pragmatic technical landscape produces uh, seem, seem, to be, seem to be of interest. So for example, flying across um, the US with the survey grid, the grid a magnificent American invention, but really a device for uh, beginning to um, uh, define properties for people that were arriving in the US and needed to buy a piece of land that had an address, if you will, uh, to sort of democratize the settlement of the US. Um, these sorts of uh, amazing field patterns in the West which have to do with interesting irrigation technology, 
um, spreading out and you know this this is a great picture because that is really just growing and expanding and spreading out across the um, Mojave Desert. The pivot irrigators is a sort of geometrical expression of water being drawn from the aquifer into a center point and then a um, uh, an irrigator strip being used to create the irrigated circles. Um, Really interesting, I think, um, tests and negotiations of soil conditions and contours by farmers in terms of trying to expand their uh, agricultural uh, production. Um, certain fallow techniques where you have these amazing strip fields where soil is put into fallow, uh, crop rotation. There's a whole science and technology behind why we have these beautiful, formal, large-scale landscapes in America. Um, strip cropping, even some industrial landscapes. This is the uh, B-52 demolition um, site in uh, New Mexico. They uh, line all of the B-52s up and they have a series of choppers that chop the wings and begin to chop the, um, the main carriage. The very large array in New Mexico uh, and certain uh, techniques of uh, surface management, if you will, that you could begin to understand in terms of design, not in a pictorial or a scenic way, but in terms of a functioning uh, and productive way. Uh, and of course, Another interesting thing about landscape is it always accrues. It's never really static. You build landscapes and they grow and they change and different layers begin to sediment. Um, so the passage of time in landscape is not only something the walker enjoys, but it's also something that's inevitable and inherent to the medium itself. Um, with regards to growth and accrual, and to this notion of thinking about landscape in productive terms rather than simply scenic terms. Um, in many ways, in our work in, in field ops, we don't really have a style. We could go totally organic in the top view or totally geometrical in the lower view. It really has to do with trying to understand form and geometry and pattern as uh, an engine for process. Not a reflection or a representation of process, but as an engine that actually um, uh, bodies forth certain types of process. Whether that's a process of uh, ecological diversification in the top, or um, the expansion of industrial citrus groves in the south. And finally, this notion that if surfaces can be understood to be um, phenomena in time, they also have various uh, responsive uh, qualities, performative qualities. So in the bottom image there is an image of sweat glands on skin. Those water globules will increase in size if the skin gets overheated in an effort to try to cool the skin down. And they'll diminish in size when the skin begins to cool. So as a sort of an aesthetic or formal or a, um, uh, a, a geometrical configuration, a made or material configuration, it's one that is actually responsive to conditions. Um, it may never look the same at any one moment in time because it's changing, it's dynamic, and it's flexing. So, Fresh Kills has been going on now for eight years. Talk about time and complexity. Um, and uh, a lot of these other projects I showed you are, 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 you know, the point of showing you these particular projects is to make this point of trying to find a working and effective relationship between large scale thinking, large scale strategy, and the sort of poetics of detail, design, and placemaking. And the interrelationship, really, between those two ways of operating. Um, it's very rare. When you think about it, most practices are good at one or the other. You have planning practices and you have design practices. 
And I think we have struggled in the past decade to really try to bring these two very close together so that the planning mind is, is, is united with the design mind and different types of scale can be broached from very, very big scale to very, very tactile uh, and intimate scale. Fresh Kills is a very good case in point, although the complexity here is, is, is more nuanced. Number one is the sheer number of players involved. It's not just uh, a design firm and a client. It's a design firm and many clients and many voices. Uh, many different governments involved and government agencies and many different communities. And you can't what this means, I, you know, it sounds kind of boring to talk about stakeholders and all of this, but what it means is that as a designer you cannot conceive of grand plans and then try to present them and expect them to be built. You really do have to grow uh, a strategy out of engagement because if you don't have people on board, um, things just don't happen. So design here has to be something that's cultivated, if you will, and, and um, uh, demonstrates responsiveness to a lot of often uh, competing and conflicting issues. Secondly, the site is very, very big. It's four square miles. Um, this is an aerial view looking north. Manhattan is just off in the top right-hand corner. Um, you're looking up to New Jersey. Um, you can see it's bisected by a freeway. The western part of the site has this massive single landfill. That landfill on the left is a mile long and 400 feet high. And on the eastern side are three other big landfills um, separated by some very beautiful meandering creeks. Um, if you overlaid that on lower Manhattan, it would be this big. It would stretch from the Battery to 26th Street and be the width of Houston Street. The third problem is simply technical. All of this four square miles of landfill is covered right now with a very, very poor um, soil, basically a clay. The engineers put the clay on it because it meets their engineering criteria of maintaining um, slopes, the kinds of slope angles they have to maintain but it's bereft of any sort of life. It's impossible to get anything to grow here apart from five weed species, um, which is kind of cool. I'm not against weed species, but when you have four square miles of the same sort of thing, it's difficult to uh, imagine how that uh, could begin to become a public landscape, let alone an ecological landscape. So how do you begin to make new soil here and how do you begin to grow a new landscape and how do you do it in such a way that the landfill engineers can still um, meet all of their obligations? And then fourthly, there are uh, competing um, programmatic demands. There are people who want more nature, more quietness, more solitude on the one hand there are people that want more active sports, more soccer, more facilities, on the other hand. There are people who want commercial uses. There are people who want um, um, uh, arts programs. Um, there are security issues. There's fear that people will come here and set fires. There's maintenance issues. There's semiotic issues. The, the, the key semiotic issue is how do you express this as um, a site of culture, a landfill, uh, you know, 50 years of 50 million tons of waste from Manhattan? How do you sort of tell that story of a landfill on the one hand and avoid the problem of naturalization or cover-up? The cover-up being that we're going to make a, a scenic landscape. There's a good number of people on the semiotic side who would like to see more expression of landfill and industriality. Um, there's another group on the other side who want to see no, zero expression of landfill and um, industriality and want to see nature and harmony. So 
this, this conflict between semiotic expectations about what the imagery and feel and story of this park should be is enormously complicated. So at the very beginning, you know, uh, you put pen to paper and you can't help but doing a bit of Linotra to begin with, with some big axial lines and a bit of uh, capability brown on the other hand with some, some um, organic forms. And then you begin to realize that no matter what you design, it's unlikely to, you know, if you view design simply as um, geometrical plan making, uh, it's not being very smart. Because what's really the problem here is a time-based issue about how you think about growing a landscape over time. So that led to this diagram very early on, which had to do with sort of just the idea of um, establishing a few colonies, colonies that could then take root and then spread and then expand and get bigger and actually grow a much more complex landscape over time, reading from left to right here. So through planting techniques or through um, land management techniques, you could actually begin with very, very simple interventions and grow complexity over a period of time. So, for example, just diagrammatically, you could begin with this idea of colonies, and the colonies would begin to self-diversify and get more complex in time as they respond to local conditions, and eventually grow something that does resemble a park, but something that came into being as, as a result of the process of its own formation. And then you start to explain that to people, and they don't quite get it because they don't want to wait 30 years for a park. They want to have something that they can get into pretty quickly, something that their children can enjoy. So we had to develop this idea that why do you think that that 30-year image of the green pastoral park is the end game? Why can't you think of the place today as already having some inherent value? And why can't you think of the various stages of its creation as having their own stages of value. In other words, there is no climax state. It is simply uh, of value and of interest at all stages of development. So for example, uh, we call this moundscape. This is sort of the site today. And indeed, there have been bus tours. And if you take some of the most skeptical, cynical, grumbling people you can ever imagine, that don't believe that fresh, anything's worthwhile at Fresh Kills. You put them on a bus, you take them around. At the end of an hour bus tour, they're absolutely transformed. They're, they can't believe the sort of uh, beauty and strange sort of qualities that they've, that they've experienced. You have these massive horizons, these big earthworks, these uh, amazing vistas across to New York and across to the estuary. You have some of the you know, biggest machines man has ever made sort of uh, move uh, trash from barges into trucks. Uh, and you have some amazing scenic moments where uh, creeks and tidal flats and nature has found a place um, within this large site. Uh, amazing experiences of weather at different times of day and the seasons. Um, you know, some really beautiful, strange, but beautiful situations. Uh, the engineering qualities uh, have their own inherent beauty in terms of just the sheer scale of some of these earthworks uh, and their geometry and their, their construction. Um, and some of the artifacts are interesting. Some of the gas vents and some of the monitoring devices and some of the um, engineering structures that make the landfill. Um, and of course, these, these big machines are, are great. So we said, you know, maybe we've already got something today. You don't need to wait um, 20 years. Maybe today, you get, uh, get these bus tours going, get people in, and begin to see this as a valuable landscape worth working with. Um, to that end, we built this sort of billboard by taking one of the big uh, landfill diggers and putting it adjacent to the uh, expressway and creating a huge uh, super sign 
that announces the, the coming of the park. And there's also a series of other spaces where you can just look in or glimpse in and use signage. Uh, this was an early idea for floating sort of activity balloons to communicate to people that this was a useful park for them. It wasn't uh, either an eyesore or just a, a place for the birds. Um, uh, this is a, a, a viewing tower that's being built by a creek. Um, so it's a place that you can come in and actually have an elevated view across the wetlands. And then uh, in the next stage, we call this a fieldscape, using this technique of beginning to cultivate the slopes of the landfill. Um, cultivate them in much the same way I showed you at the beginning with the, with the um, field patterns, where tractors are literally uh, cultivating the slopes and the uh, lowlands of the landfills. And what they're doing is growing uh, very, very fast growing uh, organic plants um, and then after six months then plowing them into the ground and planting them again and then plowing them into the ground. It's called green manure. You're actually building soil. Um, it's demonstrated that within six years of this activity you can build nearly eight inches of organic topsoil. So it's built in site. There's no importing of soil from afar and you have the additional benefit of this sort of surreal effect of these big carpets um, running across the facade of these mounds. Remember then one of them is nearly a mile long so to have this sort of parallel striping of gold, red, blue, uh, brown, uh, green at different times of year in the sequence is part of an idea about bringing a very strong and vivid expression of a landscape process, soil making, into public consciousness. Um, it's also about diversifying the life forms on the site and beginning to create a, a, a more ecologically rich situation. And then maybe, you know, based on that, beginning to create a, a richer landscape and invest in the construction of uh, programmatic uh, uh, places with new uh, gateways and bridges and places for access, um, a new road as part of a park road program, and off-trail mountain biking and places for school kids as well as nature programs. And we have these sorts of floating barge gardens and being able to engage with some of the historical artifacts that are part of the site. Maybe then, after a certain amount of time, there's more money, you begin to invest in um, uh, making very special places, significant places. This place is um, atop that westernmost mound. The figure you see on the top, the V, is actually the, um, represents the World Trade Towers in terms of the real width and height, as if they were laid on the ground. Because this is the site that the uh, debris from Ground Zero was barged to and then sorted through in, as part of a huge recovery effort. So to acknowledge that, or to sort of remember the, the recovery effort that happened here, we proposed this huge earthwork that is literally the size of the towers. There's no signage or demarcation, simply the experience of a walk that would take five minutes to ascend one and five minutes to ascend the other. So a 10 minute walk on a pure geometrical incline open to the sky. 10 minutes is plenty of time to uh, induce the sort of reflection on the scale and the magnitude of that event and of the original towers. And on the final moment at the high point, you're literally on axis with uh, lower Manhattan and it would be the highest point on the site. Then there's investment in a series of other places, places that you can't really uh, think about dealing with right now. They're too expensive, they're too complicated, but in time they will begin to be uh, developed. Certain locations of the park that could be shaped and invested in and made into more substantial public spaces where you can actually get kayaks into, into the creeks 
and actually have large uh, public uh, spaces, simple spaces, but great for uh, the public being able to come out in large numbers and enjoy public life in this sort of context. And then finally, you might get to uh, a fully built out park that is nonetheless still subject to management and still subject to growth and change. But ultimately, I think if we can retain this idea, which is something of massive scale landscape, uncontaminated with the scenic, um, you know, sort of uh, willfulness of designers to leave a mark, but to actually have a very, very large scale sense of green. This is actually a view that borrows from the green belt so that the the simple scale of having four square miles of undeveloped land in the metropolitan area of New York connected to the Staten Island Green Belt would be a massive, massive piece of um, green open space. And if we can get to that point, I think that would be a very special legacy for the city to have. And finally, the High Line. The High Line is another project that is both big and small. Um, everybody, uh, I don't know. I was going to say everybody thinks it's big, but everybody also thinks it's small. Um, it's big because it's a mile and a half long, uh, and it runs across a major, um, you, you know, complicated part of the city on the west side. Uh, but it's small, too. It's only, um, in this view, you see a 30-foot dimension, the five-foot on center registering two rail tracks there. It's big in its length, and it's really small in its um, dimension. It's also big in its thinking. Um, the High Line is an economic motor for uh, stimulating new investment and new development on the west side. It's big in its preservation thinking. It's a huge effort to argue for and successfully conserve a piece of industrial infrastructure that so many people wanted to pull down and viewed as simply being derelict. It's big in terms of uh, its ambitions for a new form of public space on the west side. But it's also small and intimate in terms of how it's made and the sorts of experiences and the sort of qualities of place that are made along, along its way. Um, this is the bigness part of it. Uh, you can see on the left is the Gansevoort beginning and the south southernmost end, and it runs up to 30th Street, and then uh, west along 30th Street to the river at 12th Avenue and around the rail yards. It's conceived of in three sections. The first 10 blocks is the section that's open now. The section two is the next 10 blocks, which will open uh, by the end of next year. And section three is the part that wraps around the, the rail yards. Um, it's big because this was its sort of origin. Um, a mile and a half of elevated train tracks, 30 feet above the uh, street. Um, no one could get there, remember? No steps, no elevators, very little connection to the High Line to adjacent structures. Um, it was a functioning piece of infrastructure built by engineers who were completely indifferent to the city and surrounded by uh, buildings that were completely indifferent to the High Line. You have two completely separate systems and, and bodies of thought. And I think that's part of the High Line's allure. Um, once the meadow grasses were sown, they, these grasses came in with seeds blown in from the wind and, and with, with birds. When the train stopped running, you had this wonderful ribbon of green for a mile and a half. And nobody knew it was there, apart from a few residents who could, who could see it from above. But if you took a walk on this, it, that singularity was amazing. An amazing uh, experience of a singular line just cutting through the city, where all of the variation is actually on the outside. A singularity is the High Line itself. Um, and then the Friends of the High Line, formed originally by Robert Hammond and uh, Joshua David, and now a very elaborate team uh, of professionals, 
but in the early days they did all they could to try to conserve and preserve the High Line and they hired the photographer, the art photographer, uh, Joel Sternfeld, to take these remarkably poetic photographs um, that just showed the sort of lonely uh, solitude of the High Line, sort of melancholic, ghostly, almost sad, um, and yet latent uh, quality of this strip of green, this ribbon of green cutting through the city. And he took the photographs in different weathers and in different lights, and they charmed everybody. All of a sudden, there was a whole new movement to conserve the High Line, to do something with the High Line, that this was too special a moment to uh, let go. And even in winter, it had very uh, stark but striking expression. Some of the big sort of industrial billboards that are adjacent to the thing or other structures are just part of its character. The way the buildings turn their back on the High Line with often blank walls or fire escapes and balconies. But these long carpets of meadow, very dynamic. Every month these, these grasses would have a different coloration, texture, uh, expression. And yet on the underside, super tough, super urban. No idea of that garden in the sky. Uh, on the underside, there are no trees, there's no greenery, it's concrete and stone and granite and a, a very impressive steel structure. The space underneath the High Line is private, so there's many different things underneath it, like Hector's Cafe or a number of parking uh, situations. And then the steel structure itself is impressive with the rivet, um, the, w the way the whole thing is made with rivets, with steel, the beams are uh, only two feet apart and four to five feet deep, enormously uh, hefty and impressive structure. This photograph shows how it was built. Essentially, it's a steel uh, frame with these hefty five foot deep beams. And on top is simply laid a very thin bed of concrete and then was about, uh, about 10 or 12 inches of stone ballast, and then the rail tracks. Is that simple? So at the very beginning, uh, you know, scratching our heads what to do, we were so enchanted with what the High Line was, how we found it and walked upon it, that, you know, we, we just said, keep it. It's so wonderful. But how do you keep it and bring hundreds of people up here at the same time and meet all of the requirements that this place be public, that it be safe, um, that it's accessible to all people of all ages and, and, and backgrounds and abilities? How do you make a public landscape and at the same time keep this sense of mystery, this sense of magic, this sense of, of green uh, singular ribbon? And how do you keep this scale? How do you avoid the problem of over-designing to the point where every block is kind of cool, but um, you've lost the sense of singularity? Because I still maintain to this day, a lot of people often ask me, what's your favorite part? My favorite part is the walk of the, it's the duration of the thing. I don't really have a favorite part. It's the duration, it's the unfolding uh, qualities of being a part of the place and not simply looking at it as a, as a single uh, moment. So, but this was the problem. If we put in a sort of path, um, we would reduce, in, in most locations, we would reduce the width of the landscape itself by nearly half. And then you've got to think about all of the things you know you've got to accommodate the wheelchairs, the maintenance carts, um, uh, you know, minimum dimensions for safe passage and for sitting. And look at the thinness in the section of uh, the, the stone ballast there, how are we expected to grow plants in something that shallow. So this was the first image we made. It was really just a, an instinct of importing a new layer onto the landscape. In this image, the thought was, let's keep the high line exactly as it is and just import uh, precast concrete planks and just put them on top and make the planks so big and heavy that when they get placed, they don't move and put them together in such a way that the landscape can grow through that 
that new import and allow that new imported surface to be the continuous surface upon which people can safely walk and have this expression of leaves and uh, green organic material thrusting through the cracks in an effort to survive and thrive. Um, of course, that's a beautifully poetic and wonderful uh, image and idea, but then you have to think about how to make it. And after winning the competition, there was a lot of effort went in to how to actually make this now, um, and how to make a paving system that that meets all of the requirements of, of public health and safety, but at the same time has a poetic expression of this sort of quality we were looking for. Another idea about that system was that we could use it to create very different landscapes. We could open it up and thicken it and thin it, um, but at the same time keep the whole thing consistent. So when you walk along 10 blocks, 20 blocks, the materiality, the detailing is consistent. It feels like it's the same thing, it's the high line. But you go through these differences. We've achieved, I think, variety within um, uh, a unified uh, theme. Um, these early diagrams had to do with how you could script and meander um, uh, the walk. In other words, the design of the High Line is not only a paving system and planting and design, etc., but it's also the choreography of a walk in terms of how views unfold, what's taken away from you, what comes into presence, and how you meander and stroll along the thing. And then we learned that we can't keep the existing rail bed, that in actual fact, all of the ballast, everything's going to be scraped off, uh, because the concrete bed needs restoring and waterproofing because there are private properties underneath the High Line. So that changed things. It led to a rethinking about how we could make this system now as a new system on a, on a bed and how we would now have to make um, a landscape in that context too. One of the things we thought of is if we keep the joints of the paving open then the rainwater would go and could be collected in a void underneath and we could use that water to drain slowly into the planting beds and help to irrigate the planting beds. There was lots of questions about this. This is a new use of a new material in the city. Uh, there were questions about its scale, its material, its finish, its fabrication. These are all a series of attempts to map it out on the site to build uh, scale mock-ups. Um, then there's the actual uh, technical aspects of how to actually document and draw the different pieces for fabrication. Um, and then the technical drawings themselves to be very precise about how this gets made and in what, and in, and in what way. Um, not going to go into this, but there's an awful lot of complexity in underneath this landscape that you don't see, but that is fundamental to it not moving, to it being stable, um, and to uh, it working in all the ways it has to work. This was up in the uh, concrete manufacturer precast facility in, in Canada, looking at how uh, the different elements could, would be made and approving uh, uh, the finish and the uh, quality of the various pieces and then here they are being brought up and lifted onto the high line and getting ready to be assembled. It was found during the restoration of the concrete bed that um, certain parts of concrete had to be removed and rebuilt. This is the standard hotel in the background in its early days being built over the high line and then once the concrete was set the uh, grading was set for drainage, uh, the waterproofing was set, they then began the installation of the, of the uh, paving. With all of this being hollow underneath the paving for water harvesting, I think we can demonstrate nearly 90% of all water that falls on the High Line stays on the High Line. And then the installation of the uh, paving, you see the expansion 
joints there, and this idea of the tapers, we call them the tapers or the cones. The idea that the paving could actually comb and bleed into the planting beds and allow uh, an interface between the rail tracks being allowed to interface with those cones and the planting being allowed to come out of the uh, cracks. You see the reinstallation of the rail tracks and then the early days of some of the first grasses that went in to come up through these cracks. All of the rails were numbered and are put back in a more or less historically accurate um, way. And there's some nice moments in terms of how these rails have an expression and how you actually come across them and how you see them. Uh, and, you know, they're quite impressive. They're six or seven inches big. Uh, they have a real substantial presence there. Then the planting design, in terms of incorporating a much uh, more diverse range of plants than were there originally, but making them integral to the landscape, growing through the tracks, and uh, working with the thing as an integrated system. So here you get that bled effect between the public landscape and the high line landscape, if you will. Secondly was the furnishing. Um, if you put your standard New York City Parks bench up here with its 24 inch base and its 30 inch back, it's, it, it, would, it would kill the scale. So we wanted to have um, seating configurations that were somehow a little skinny, um, working with the, with the narrow dimensions that we had on the High Line and also design them so that they're part of the system. They grow out of the uh, precast system. And design them in a way that sometimes you can have a back, you can put your back uh, back and rest, and sometimes you have an end point and you can sit on the end and look upstream or downstream. So these are actually seats that allow multiple ways of sitting. Um, there's an interesting way in which they're fabricated and put together. And again, sometimes clustered in ways like a flock. Um, and the, the sheer number of ways in which people use these is amazing. I mean, exceeded everyone's expectations in t just in terms of how people use the seating. They, they face ways you never thought they would face. They, they, uh, uh, children like to actually use the slide. People lie against the back. Um, and people sit in different configurations as individuals or as groups uh, and spark up new conversations, quite a dating scene going on. Um, at the sun deck we have these super huge uh, sun loungers that face the sun uh, and the construction of these two is fairly hefty. They're designed to last. They have a steel uh, frame, and then the ipe wood is wrapped around the frame. That some of them are designed with wheels, so you can actually <coughs> wheel them uh, along the tracks and actually group them together in pairs or threes. And again, the way in which people have appropriated these um, benches just, again, exceeded everyone's expectation. We thought there might be a few people sitting on them at a time, but there, there's people lining up and waiting to get a spot on a sunny day. And thirdly, the planting with uh, Piet Udolf, a uh, Dutch horticulturalist and really an expert in perennial plants which are very tolerant of very stressful conditions in the city. And in many ways as an artist with, with the plant material in terms of color and texture and uh, composition and combination. Um, but again, technically very, very shallow uh, soil depths, so the, te the technical details of how to uh, get the planting to work, the idea of layers of plants from a, uh, a grass layer to a shrub layer and a flowering layer to a woodland or canopy layer. Um, and this idea that over time, uh, through management, and the Friends of the High Line have hired a wonderful team of gardeners and um, management team, over time and through management, these planting beds will be made better. They'll be enriched and diversified um, as, uh, as time goes by. 
One of the ideas is that plants should not be cut down in the winter, so that in the winter you have this strong textural expression. Some of these plants have their best expression in, uh, in November, December, January, February, actually. They're enormously textural and colorful uh, and so on. Another big part of the story is, 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 is having to pre-grow a lot of these plants. They're not um, common in nurseries, so we had to order them ahead of time and get them pre-grown and coordinate the uh, drainage systems on the floor so that the water that's collected under the paving drains through and works through to the drains. So again, in this sequence, you see the soil being imported, the plants being hoisted up, the trees coming up, everything being sort of placed for location, these little potted plants in between the tracks, uh, put into combination, put into mix, we call it a matrix, uh, that's sort of an integrated mix of these different plants, uh, working in between sleepers and rails to have that effect of growing through the, through the intervals. And growing up, this is very early on, um, and having this sort of seasonal display. So finally, just to walk from the uh, Gensevoort end, this is the beginning, the big stair and the landing. Um, this idea of the section cut at the end with a sort of an overlook into the, into the district. This is a place where the High Line has great expression on Washington Street, so we wanted it to be really green. We have the big trees there, and this contrast between a hard, urban underside and a really verdant, green, wooded topside. Um, this is a slide of what used to be a building that used to be under there, and of course the building now um, to the left has been demolished and will be the new Whitney Museum, uh, designed by Renzo Piano. Uh, and you can see this end point here. The stairs, of course, you know we worked with Dilla Scafidio and Renfro, and Rick Scafidio um, paid a lot of attention to this sort of detailing, how the stair um, is hung from the structure, um, the sort of durational character of the stair. In other words, you walk up uh, a flight to a landing that brings you very close to the underside of the structure, and then the second flight brings you into the void that's cut into the structure. So this idea of a long, slow, durational promenade, experiencing the structure and then coming up into the sky, I think it's wonderfully theatrical and really sets the contrast between the underside and the top side. So an early rendering, and then the construction and the narrow, this long narrow staircase coming up into the sky. And then you come into the garden at the top. When you're on the top, we call them provisionally the train track gardens. It's an idea of coming up into the landscape and uh, seeing something that it meets your expectations, if you will, of what the Sternfeld quality of the landscape would be with train tracks and greenery and paving um, meshed together and the interface of the plants and the material. Places to sit at certain locations under the Blakeman Tunnel, uh, onto the sun deck, which is at 14th Street, faces southwest for the sun and amazing views across the uh, river. This was on opening day when no one was there. It was all squeaky clean. And then the day after opening, I was a little disappointed on opening day because all I saw were like these architecture students from Germany who were very serious with their big cameras. And I thought, oh boy, it's not going to be real. And the second day, this was it. This was reality. And these were not um, just tourists. They were uh, residents in the neighborhood. There were old people, young people, families, individuals. It was a, it was a great moment where you suddenly realize that the High Line is now a real public space and all sorts of different people want to come up and be a part of urban life. I like this view because, uh, it's not, maybe it's not this one, oh yeah it is, because um, we had renderings like this with people in bikinis and guys with no shirts on and we were told to take those people out because that's, those aren't real people. 
But, you know, reality exceeds, uh, exceeds expectations. You have all sorts of people up here using these things in all sorts of different ways, and it's really, again, just exceeded everyone's expectations of how it would be appropriated. These are the rolling decks and um, different people sitting. We never thought someone would sit on it sideways like that, but there you go. Um, and then the water feature is a uh, work in progress but should be open in the spring is this idea of a sheet of water as if it's coming up uh, through, through the cracks of the paving and it's something you can put your feet in and uh, enjoy and relax and see the view. The preserve is a spur that is planted simply as a sort of um, uh, space that has no public access. It's like a piece of preserved high line. Uh, with some extraordinary plants uh, that attract birds and butterflies. It's a wonderful place. The Chelsea Market Tunnel is the big event space. It's lit. We worked with um, Hervé Descartes of L'Observatoire, who has this theatrical sense of lighting, and uh, lit this really like a Tyrell-type space that just glows in a wonderful uh, quality of, of violet and neon and the temperature of the light can be adjusted and it's just a fabulous space and it, on a hot day it's a welcome uh, piece of shade as well as providing space for events. The sunken overlook is at the 10th Avenue Square. This is where the High Line turns into a square as it goes over 10th Avenue and there was an opportunity here to actually you know, make, take advantage of the avenue as a location the idea of the sunken square is to um, uh, create a wood surface that's different from the rest of the High Line, acknowledges that it's a different location, and it has two halves. The, uh, the top half looks south to the Statue of Liberty, the lower half looks north along 10th Avenue, and the lower half is cut into the structure and then a big window is built in the face that creates a window that you can both look out of as well as look up into. And this is a sort of the idea of, of the window then framing the movement of traffic below. It's quite a piece of work though to uh, cut all this steel out, build the new structure, cut out the space for the window, and then rebuild uh, this uh, theatrical setting where the window is really a wonderful frame to the street below. Again, enormously popular. You often see people with champagne and strawberries. And, uh, but also great from the street. You can actually see into, the, into the, the performances that are happening in the window. And you get this great sort of sense of social life and public life um, communicated <coughs> between the street level and the high line level. And at night time, it's very uh, dramatic. Um, this is the area of the 10th Avenue Square looking south to the Statue of Liberty. These are the same um, bench elements built out of wood. And finally, the last stretch are the gardens. And these are really just a simple promenade idea of being able to stroll through beautiful plantings and enjoy city views into the Chelsea neighborhood. And just, it gets really narrow here, but there are places to sit um, and bring you really close to some extraordinary plants. I love this one. Uh, highly photographed. Almost everybody that walked by it couldn't help but touch it and pull out a phone or something and take a photograph. And uh, again, you get the idea of the plants and the people walking in the meadow. And finally, as we're looking towards section two, the will be a sort of a transition from section one to section two through a sort of a thicket area that will bring you into a big, we call it the sun lawn. It's a 50 foot wide area um, that gets a lot of light and doesn't have tall buildings adjacent to it. It's a wonderful uh, uh, block to be able to have a big social space like this. And then we go onto a steel catwalk that's eight feet above the ground and we'll actually walk you through a stand of trees between two very, very tall buildings. 
Um, these were originally a stand of trees that were here originally. They grew here because the buildings cast shade and it was damp. Uh, and we want to recreate a sense of, uh, a sense of the wild high line, if you will, um, super vegetated, and bring the visitor high uh, in relationship to, to that. And also create these overlooks into the street, again, a little bit like the sunken overlook where we have these framed conditions where you can look into the street below and people in the street can see the actors above. And finally, a very uh, simple end to this run, uh, a, a simple straight uh, meadow landscape trying to invoke the Sternfeld uh, melancholy. Many of the buildings in this context are these old Chelsea, New York buildings, so it's really a great setting for that. And finally, at 30th Street, a sort of a Gordon Matter Clark piece where we take off the structure, reveal the steel structure of the High Line and have a viewing platform on that with views looking east and west out to the river and into um, uh, towards the Empire State Building, but actually show something about the structure, the original structure of the thing, while allowing light into the street below uh, where there would be a major access point. And a great sort of viewing deck, again, with just celebrating some of the most amazing views the city has to offer especially from this 30-foot elevation above the street. And actually maybe walking through the structure and engaging the structure as a lighter uh, piece of architecture. And that's it. I'd like to thank you very much for your patience.